So, so great. Good evening, everybody. Once again, Toshi, Delhi Athan Society of India welcomes you along with Eco India to the third session of food, the certificate course on refresher training for ophthalmologists and diagnosis and management of food, diabetes retinopathy. And today's topic is a very interesting topic. It's a diabetes vitectomy, and it will be um, presented by none other than our president, Padma Sri, Professor Dr. Natarajan. It's a case presentation come directly to lecture. As you know, since last 7th July, after launching of this program, we are having every fortnight one lecture, I mean, case presentation followed by a lecture by one of our members of TOSI. And already two sessions are over. And today the third session, and this is by none other than, as I told you, our president, Dr. Natarajan, and all the spokes who have joined today, I welcome them to this meeting. And I wish, I wish they should at least complete 70% of their attendance, these programs, then they will be eligible for to get a certificate. So I think all the spokes, they understand this. So they'll try to join our future meetings. This is the schedule. This will continue till 6th October. And today's program, along with me, Dr. Patnaik, Dr. Savitar Patnaik, and Dr. Sheila John are the facilitators and our experts, as usual, uh, Dr. Kim, Dr. Raju Raman, Dr. Santil, Dr. Sandeepak Rai, Dr. Abhishek Sachdev, Dr. Asok Nanda, and Dr. Kavita Rao. So yeah. these, these are the experts. So, and I request the spokes. So today, one of the spokes is volunteered to present a case before our um, August gathering, that is Dr. Aditi Parasar. So now I will hand over the mic to our moderator of today's session, Dr. Sheila John, to introduce the guest and to start the program. It's over to you, Dr. Sheila John. Just to stop sharing the screen. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, it's over to you. Today's speaker is Professor Dr. S. Nadrajan Sir. He is Chairman and Managing Director, Aditya Jodh A Hospital, Managing Trustee of Aditya Jodh Foundation for Twinkling Little. He has been awarded the Padma Shri, one of the highest civilian awards by President of India in 2013. And also the state award for his meritorious public service in 2016 by the government of Jammu and Kashmir for two and a half days performed a record of 47 VR surgeries and many of the patients had pellet injuries. He's a multifaceted personality like his guru, Dr. Isis Bhatriyat sir from Shankar. Due to his acumen and knowledge and distinction of holding many prestigious posts, president of organized Medical Academic Bill, immediate past president of All India Ophthalmic Society, Secretary General, and Director of Trustees International Council of Ophthalmology, and many more. He's also the president of Delhi Ophthalmic Society, Ophthalmic Society, recipient of several international vertical field ophthalmology. He has been charter inductee, Retina Hall of Fame, and many more. He is a renowned vitreoretinal surgeon and has 36 years of experience and has performed over 60,000 vitreal and retinal surgeries and trained more than 68 vitreoretinal surgeons across the globe. He has attended invited guest lectures, conducted instruction courses, and done many international and national publications, written chapters and books. 
He has established an NGO, Aditya Jyoti Foundation, for twinkling little people. He helped underprivileged people in slums of Bombay. Acquired Guinness records for performing the most diabetic retinopathy screening on 26 Jan 2019 in eight hours to 649 diabetic patients. Through the Roti Bank, he has been feeding the needy as a compassionate person. Sir, there's a need and introduction at all. I'm, known, I'm sure all his achievements are known to everyone. We extend a warm welcome to you, sir, and we invite you to deliver your ex lecture. Uh, for a very detailed uh, introduction, I'll share my screen and good evening to all the participants. And I know many of them. And uh, 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 thank you. And my um, my dream project is uh, the dream uh, to uh, create a diabetic uh, blind free India. And that's why, as an all India ophthalmic society, I took up diabetic community. I'm glad, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Subhuti is really assisting me in this, along with Dr. Rajiv Raman, Dr. Sheila John, Dr. Savesa Chupatnaik, Dr. Kim, uh, and uh, all the executive members of TOSI, as well as the uh, um, as well as the okay, the All India Ophthalmic Society uh, members. So I'll share the screen. So I know this uh, today's topic is uh, diabetic vitrectomy, but uh, I'm also going to just uh, cover the things what we have done in the past. So the, my topic is uh, 3D fantasy surgery, which took me for a uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy. I have added 3D fantasy because uh, I have now started doing all the surgery under the 3D microscope. So with the burden of diabetes, all of us know, and that's why we are uh, actually, uh, Dr. Uh, Shar Sharma has raised the hand. Anything you want to ask, madam? Dr. Vinakaran Sharma, you put your, raise your hand. Okay. And uh, so the burden of diabetes is, uh, according to International Diabetic Federation, India has 77.7 million diabetics. Among them, about 40% uh, uh, do not know they have diabetes. And by 2045, it is estimated to go up to 134.3 million. In fact, by 2030, according to the estimate, 8.4% of India's adult population will have diabetes. That means out of 1.4 billion, 8.4% is about... Uh, Something like uh, 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 like uh, uh, around 1.4. I think you will have something like a, a, a eight a eight million or eighty billion statistics. So, and the diabetic blindness is a challenge. It is an epidemic happening, and the problem is every diabetic will be affected with something, and some of them will die. And it's an incurable problem, which unfortunately people don't realize. And eye symptoms are too late, and that's the reason. We are doing this program and prevention is better than cure, which we learned in preventive and social medicine uh, when we are all undergraduates. But unfortunately, including me, when I was an undergraduate, the preventive and social medicine professor used to teach and we used to laugh because uh, we were talking about sanitation and hygiene and how, and I like now during Corona, we understand those things as preventive. So we see these sort of traction attachments and how we can prevent that's uh, what I want to convey to the talk, even though vitrectomy can be done. Uh, India and Mexico has this sort of severe retina problem like this. But the rest of the world, wherever the diabetes, uh, they're able to diagnose early and uh, do laser angiogram injections, they don't see so bad traction retinal detachment. So the other problem, which produces, uh, we already had a talk by Dr. Rajiv Raman, clinically significant macular edema. And uh, the other, we are going to talk about this non-clearing vitreous hemorrhage. If you have seen in the history in the 70s, and when I became a vitreoretinal surgeon with Dr. Badinath, uh, people were waiting for one year and sometimes six months. And now the reason is because of the pros and cons of surgery was a problem. And in the 70s, 
the instrument used was a whisk whisk uh, which is infusion suction cutter and it was a 1.4 uh, mm uh, probe so if you, something like a phaco probe and you introduce in the fast vena with the light and infusion everything in one and you remove the eye the whole eye will collapse and then you have combined tractional regmatogenic tractional detachment and these are the indication for uh, vitrectomy and you see in the taut posterior hyaloid producing distortion of maxilla and you see in the uh, oct where you see the vitreous uh, which is contracting and making pulling the retina and these sort of surgery things before the era of oct we could not uh, suggest surgery because macula looks all right in the fundus photographs except the optic disc and the paravascular region but in the oct you can see the macula is being pulled and the membrane is stretching across the retina and uh, this uh, rubiosis iridis associated with vitreous hemorrhage as you see here there's a vitreous hemorrhage covering the optic disc and macula so upper part of retina is uh, seen but uh, the problem is the patient has not undergone laser and then they have developed rubiosis once upon a time when i was in uh, shankaranayakula as a consultant it was a contraindication and there was a our vaginas were very particular as a fellow we have to write no rubiosis iridis and i practice even today that indicates that you are examine the eye before the dilatation using slit lamp biomicroscopy when a diabetic eye and i think uh, you should see the patient as a whole and i teach as well as the patients and the relative diabetes affects from head to foot that means the brain the eyes the heart the, the kidney and then the feet that means the nephropathy uh, diabetic neuropathy diabetic retinopathy diabetic cardiomyopathy and uh, stroke because of the diabetes so i think uh, and diabetic blindness the causes are as you saw as a uh, as a just diabetic macular edema tot uh, posterior hyaloid which will be which will require vitrectomy traction retinal detachment neovascular glaucoma rubius iridis which is hemorrhage where we can give an anti vegf and 48 uh, 24 hours later we can do a vitrectomy so the treatment also was uh, covered in the past three uh, sessions where pan retinal photocoagulation is still the gold standard for india even though the di uh, diabetic uh, Uh, studies in the abroad, particularly from the uh, uh, internet, where Dr. Neil Bessler and others are involved, where they have said monthly anti-vegf injection for a year, with no need for a panel photocoagulation. But the cost of treatment is very heavy for a ordinary Indian citizen. And intravenous steroids has a limited, and we generally don't recommend because of the risk of uh, fungal infection, which Dr. Uh, um amud gupta from panchandigarh has pointed out and finally we talk about vitrectomy and that's a top kick today and we have to do laser like this except the optic disc and macula you can see preretinal hemorrhage on the photograph on the left eye and in the right eye you see dot hemorrhages here so when you do a fluorescent angiography you will see capillary non perfusion before the florid neovascularization of disc or elsewhere if you do a pan retinal photocoagulation like this i think you can save the eye and even if this patient develops a vitreous hemorrhage They may not develop traction, and then by doing a vitrectomy, I you can get six six and five vision. But the problem is when the macula is affected, then the vision is gone down, and then a survey of every patient who is coming. How many years they are diabetic? They will say twenty years. And when was the first time retina checked? Two months back. You can imagine. I recommend, uh, irrespective of WDF and uh, all other uh, recommendation, as soon as you are diagnosed diabetes in India. You should have a basic retina examination. What is the harm by dilating and checking your retina? You are not losing anything. So my suggestion is have a baseline under photo OCT. It may cost some money, but now government hospitals, municipal hospitals have good OCT and under photo. So go to government hospital if you don't have money. Get a basic photograph. They don't give. Doesn't matter. You keep it in the system. Go every six months and have a checkup. And uh, anti vegf and steroid, which has been uh, covered, and I am talking about vitrectomy. and you need a excellent vitreous surgery machine the whole idea of the vitrectomy is to restore and maintain vision and the surgical objectives include thorough removal of the vitreous bleed the endophotocoagulation for the capillary non perfusion and if the macula is detached reattach the detached macula so this see here we have a 48 year old male with a sudden diminution of vision in both eyes either diabetic since lavin years on insulin on poor glycemic control his vision in both eyes is finger counting half meter on examination he had which is hemorrhage 
with a diabetic traction attachment in both eyes, right eye followed by left eye vitrectomy was done one week apart. And you can see the vision improved to 618 after six weeks. You can see the I'm using a 23 gauge uh, power spinal vitrectomy. I, I placed the infusion line and now I'm placing the upper, upper temporal and upper nasal. And you see it's a three port power spinal vitrectomy, transconjunctival, transcleral. And now you are removing the vitreous hemorrhage. And uh, here, the uh, uh, whole idea is you need a sophisticated equipment. The reason is when you cut and remove, they have, it should not produce traction on the retina. That's what you see here. You see a fibrous proliferation arising from the fire, optic disc and spreading and fanning over with the vitreous into the vitreous cavity and producing a traction nasal to the optic disc. Now I'm doing a diathermy. You can see the diathermy bubbles happening and that the whitish is the diathermy. And after the diathermy, if I'm cutting, still there's some ooze happening. So the idea is I don't like to erase the bottle height uh, very much because the bottle height can compromise the circulation to optic nerve. Sometimes you have an excellent vitrectomy and pale optic disc. And even if you have a pale optic disc, I think uh, the vision can be good. But uh, my suggestion is to do the vitrectomy with a 20 millimeter of uh, uh, pressure so that uh, uh, the, and then make sure you do good diathermy and do a, a thorough, uh, maybe if you require, you can do a 24 hours before injector so that the fire vascular element can be controlled. And the only thing is you should have a medical fitness before you do the antivascular growth infection injection because after injection and if the patient becomes unfit and if you don't operate, the vascular element will be gone and then the fibrous element will start and that will produce traction and detachment. Sometimes inoperable detachment can become an inoperable detachment. So you have to be extremely careful. I'm using the retinal brush clearing the surface of retina. Now I'm using a curved uh, retinal laser probe and, and they're doing delivery during the operation later. And it was so nice of Dr. Bajanath to introduce the first endo laser photographation in India. And he asked me to do the first vitrectomy and then the endo laser in uh, Shankanetrale. And we, I, use, I presented that in 1988 in the already of conference when nobody had endo laser in India at that time. It's really nice of Dr. Badinath to allow me, because even though I was the youngest veteran surgeon that time, at the age of 27, I became a veteran surgeon. And that to experience VR surgeon from 84 onwards. So I'm really uh, doing a, a, a thanks to my mentor for training. And this patient that got 618 after six weeks vision. And this is a case two. Radiodiabetic retinopathy with a vision of two by 60, where a pre-op photograph showing the extensive fibrous stuff. So I, the idea of this today's talk is if you see a fundus like that, please don't tell the patient that it's very bad and send it off. You tell them eye is bad, but you can go to experienced surgeons all over India. For example, if you're in Andhra, refer to Ayali uh, Prasad. If you're in Tamil Nadu, refer to Shankanetralia, in Madras, or in Ayali Prasad, the uh, Madurai Arvindai Hospital. Many, I mean, there are a lot of hospitals. I'm just naming few because uh, that comes to mind. I mean, every city has a veterinary surgeon. They have big centers, all Indian Institute of Medical Sciences. I think, please refer the patient because the first contact is a GP maybe, a diabetes doctor when you have a lot of vision. I don't know why they said, oh, you're too late and they don't send the patient. So you can see, you can see the result. You'll be seeing, a, I'm doing a 25 gauge proportional mode vitrectomy in this patient. And 25 gauge is a, a, the, again, transcreated, transcreated level. So I do, I am happy that I introduced the sutureless which is surgery first in India in 2004 with Mark Humayun, who's the founder of uh, or a pioneer in innovative surgeon doing uh, uh, the artificial retina. And he also introduced the, that time the Bosch and Lama introduced the first uh, 23 gauge vitrectomy, 25 gauge vitrectomy. Then they went to 23 gauge by dark. You can see um, uh, the cut cutting the fibrous tissue and uh, because it is a long-standing fibrovascular proliferation, vascular element is gone. So now I'm using the proportional mode. What is proportional mode? Fl pushing the fluid using the cutter from the back into the eye and then the, make a cleavage between the fibrous tissue and the membrane. And then the curved edge uh, like this is the fibrous tissue there. I go like this and curved uh, thing, I cut the vitrectomy, which is, uh, and you see that now I'm pushing the fluid between the membrane and the retina. And the idea is uh, it is like uh, the fluid acts like a blade. It is like a water blade, 
But the only thing is the water blade is uh, safe because uh, you are not having cooling effect, and then the water pushes the and makes a cleavage between the fibers. So only thing is a patient the surgery, and again uh, you don't need a four port parchment of vitrectomy, which we do. I'll be showing using a chandelier illumination, using both hands to do biomanual, which is here you are having one hand for light and the other hand for doing the uh, vitrectomy or uh, for so instead of force, you can see that blood which was uh, like a suck and spit. That means like an infiller, suck the blood or the fluid and then push it back. And you see with the brush now, I'm now uh, removing the surface of the blood using the, uh, this is actually a modified Charles Chute needle, which is now called the Joanovich retinal brush. And Joanovich is my second mentor who retired in 96. And you see vitrectomy is done. And then I, I fill the eye with the SF6 gas. And then you can see the uh, post-op division of 6-9, but you can see the object is pale. All the fibrous tissue is gone. It doesn't look like that uh, you have operated. See, you can see this was the pre-op uh, picture. So this was the pre-op picture. And then this is the post-op picture. So the same eye you can produce, but it, uh, you need uh, enough patience and a uh, real uh, excellent tactile sensation and then do it. And I think uh, this is a, a third case, 49 year old female with a history of diabetes in 20 years. She was di diagnosed to have a combined retinal detachment and cataract. So she underwent fake commercialization by my colleague, Dr. Kavita Rao, and I did the 25 gauge. So I don't do cataract at all. And you can see the cataract is quite advanced. And then uh, here she is making the uh, brilliant blue staining of the anterior capsule. And she'll do the capsular excess. And then uh, she's using the viscoat and then uh, making the capsular rexes and then do the paper emulsification. And uh, she will place the intraocular lens. And uh, you can see she's now placing the intraocular lens. I always tell, complete the uh, cataract uh, surgery, do the FACO, put the lens, clear everything. And then I will also do the hydration and you go and I will get in after that. Now I'm starting the 23 gauge same as though it's in a previously pseudo fake tie, I do it. And uh, since it's the airtight, watertight suture, and the needle is quite uh, sharp, you can enter without any problem. And in the, in the beginning, maybe you can have one suture, and then later you can remove it also. You can see the anteroposterior traction is being relieved, and then I'm removing the which is uh, hemorrhage, and then uh, looking uh, and clearing the anteroposterior traction, tangential traction, and you see there is a fibrous proliferation from the optic disc, preretinal hemorrhage over the macula, and the fibrovascular proliferation is extending nasally and produced a combined regmatal genus. That means the retinal break. There are two retinal breaks you can see. The fibrous tissue is connected from the optic disc to the break. And now I am meticulously doing a diathermy. It's a bipolar in the sides of the retinal break to identify the retinal break after I do a fluid air exchange. So the idea is to see where the break. And now I'm detaching the uh, fibrous uh, fibrous proliferation and uh, from the attached retina. So you can see, in spite of the diathermy, it bleeds. Now I'm using the uh, cutter and I also removing the hemorrhage, which happened when I did the fibrous proliferation, which entered into the retinal hole. And I'm now using the suction and removing the blood from the subretinal space. And I'm clearing the entire uh, 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 subretinal space from the bleeding. And then uh, now I'm again uh, using the, uh, the cutter and separating the uh, fibrous tissue from the, uh, uh, the, the retinal break. And I'm now using the cutter again to use the, uh, remove all the uh, traction. Now I'm doing a diathermy around the retinal break, which is pre-existing and since nasal to the disc and I'm safely doing diathermy. The reason is, uh, Near macula, you can be you have to be careful because uh, if it contracts, you can produce a traction on the macula. Now I'm using the cutter itself to using the suction mode and removing the pre-retinal hemorrhage, and uh, and so I can work under magnification. And uh, so now you can see the diathermy I'm doing on the fibrous tissue again. So I remove, clear the debris, and then I go back with the cutter, go back with the retinal brush. Now as you see here. The surgery 
cutting edge video strategy by myself dr astha jain and dr sandeep saxena published by springer i know it's expensive but there is a chapter written by me called surgical self education and uh, steve charles book where every surgeon has to read that that, that means you should uh, do a self analysis how good you are do you have the temperament to do a be a veterinary surgeon and you have the patience do you have the binocular vision do you have a strong back or do you have the good operating chair with a uh, hand rest so that i am now using a perfluorocarbon liquid which is like a third hand pressing the retina like this and then uh, the perfluorocarbon liquid is kept up to the brim of the retinal break here and then i am now using the vitreous forceps to detach the fibrous tissue from the underlying retina and sometimes i use the light pipe to tease the membrane uh, so that the idea is uh, i can just pull it out but it will tear the retina and it can produce retinal hemorrhage so the it has to be very meticulously done and uh, uh, very skillfully done and that's what uh, every day i'm thankful to dr bajnath for giving me the transfer of skill to me now you see i removed the fibrous tissue and mars and i have the habit of sending the fibrous tissue to dr bishwas for a histopathology you know we know what is the pathology but i send it as a routine just to study what is the tissue i removed what is the pathology i am dealing with with the report may take two three days to come as a matter but i can you can see now i am doing an endo drainage to the retinal break the perfluorocarbon liquid is keeping the optic disc and the macula a flat and then the endo drainage is to remove the subretinal fluid at present you can see because of the wide angle observation system which i introduced first time in almost in the world after dr spitzner in germany in 1990 and dr badnath inaugurated it at the hospital we just completed 31 years uh, they were today and i am in the 32nd year thanks to the all the patrons the patients the the staff doctors so now i am doing an endo laser around the retinal break and uh, also doing the laser between the optic disc and the break so that the retina remains attached and then uh, you can see i have done a thorough laser and i am doing final touches near the and i am also completing a pan retinal photocoagulation uh, so that the capillary drop uh, drop out area and the, it will not produce new vascularization because anoxia produces new vascularization because the new blood vessels are formed because of they are hungry for oxygen so you reduce the content need for oxygen by doing laser destroying the peripheral retina and having the central retina intact as you see here and then it is exactly like doing a pan retinal photocoagulation in the uh, 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 circular mode and here you are doing the endo laser mode and uh, so i am glad uh, that i am w- working on retina like this you can see the uh, cataract done trochlear lens there and uh, gas in the eye and the patient uh, did well and this is a uh... so this is uh, i i think the, this is a twin light vitrectomy which is again a very old video i took it purposefully the reason is that I, this was the 20 gauge three port pass pen vitrectomy we opened the conjunctiva then i'm using this uh, uh, twin light where i'm using a stiletto to enter the eye by making a 25 gauge entry now i'll be entering this uh, two, uh, two lights like uh, you, you're eliminating the entire one hall with one light as i said here i have two light which is eliminating the entire hall and then i use two ports upper temporal and upper nasal like one hand for catching with the forcep and other hand for cutting with the scissors you will be seeing that and uh, this was the old and uh, uh, very old technology i mean 95 and that is why dr jovanovich taught me this and this is like a curved one of scissors which uh, you anti segment surgeons use where you catch the tissue with the hand and use the curved scissors and cut exactly like that the only problem dr jovanovich in his preface has written the vitreous cavity is small it is behind the lens and then the space between the lens and the retina is very small dark that's why there were no instruments in 85 i think when we started the 84 85 along with dr badnath when we started we didn't have even a fluid air exchange machine we used the fish air pump for air injection and we had only forceps we had a curved scissors we had a horizontal scissors and we had a, a vertical scissors for delamination and segmentation but we didn't have the curved scissors which was developed by dr jovanovich along with the, another engineer called ger feinfinkel who is the one who developed dot machine so i'm glad 
I was trained by an innovative uh, pers- a surgeon who taught me how to think and uh, how the innovations happened, along with Dr. McMahon, who was the first man who did the vitrectomy for diabetes as well as amyloidosis in 1971 in uh, Durham. And he did the first vitrectomy in action in a garage in 1971. And that's why he's the father of modern vitreous surgery. And later, Dr. Jovanovich combined vitrectomy and uh, the uh, oil, silicon oil. And that, that's why he's called the father of modern vitreous surgery. Before that, Dr. John Scott did vitrect- without vitrectomy or injecting oil. So now you can see there is some amount of prenatal hair happening. I'm catching the tissue and removing. And it looks so simple, hold it and cut it. But we, in, the, in the 80s, we were doing with one hand. That means left hand is holding like a torchlight and right hand we are using cutter with all that. And here we have the entire retina is illuminated and you can do bimanual real two hand surgery. And I remember many times uh, that uh, various surgeons from all over the world used to tell me, hey, what man, you're not using one hand. But we were using that because we needed a, uh, to eliminate and this is another eye you'll be seeing how bad the traction at that so the reason i'm showing bad eyes are that even these sort of eyes can be salvageable but this vision may get uh, sometimes uh, from pl they may get counting finger close to face dr gulapalli rao the founder of elvi prasad always used to tease me and saying that oh you people you retina surgeons are uh, only having carrying your vision uh, chart in your hand that means what in your pocket that means you, you put the hand in the pocket. He says, can you see? Can you see now? Patients get 660, 636 with the using low vision aid. 636 patient can read M6 with a video magnifier. And they can use video magnifier to see, watch television. And I think it's a question of how to use it. And you can see how meticulous we can dissect the, the tissue. And I think uh, tissue care I learned from Dr. Badinath. And even in Bombay, we had Dr. Ursaker, who was another great VR surgeon, even though he was a pioneer, but he was not trained with a surgeon. He was a self-trained man. He learned from Dr. McAmer by visiting him, but not by trained by him. But I think I learned a lot from a lot of people, but the main mentors were Dr. Badina and Dr. Jovanovich. They both were really revolutionary. They were innovative. They were created history. And I'm glad I worked with Dr. McAmer also. And only thing I could not get Dr. McAmer to uh, Bombay or India. And Dr. Badinath was always uh, astonished how I could get the best veterinary surgeons to come for conducting a VR surgeon, VR surgery course called the International Advanced VR Surgery Course in Bombay with a mega screen. And that's why now I use the, which you'll be seeing shortly, what I do daily. It's like I've got a, like a, I have a fancy for watching movies. So now I got a 77 inch uh, new TV, which is a OLED, that is organic uh, LED light emitting device, which is amazing. So same thing I'm doing in the operation theater, wearing the 3D glass, which you'll be seeing. And you can see, like uh, I sometimes, uh, when I was operating similar trauma patients in Kashmir, the uh, the newspaper, uh, the New York Times covered me. They they were all covered, not allowed to inside OT, but I told them, come and see what we are doing. So she said, you're operating for three hours and four hours. How much vision the patient will get? I said, maybe counting finger half meter. She said, are you struggling for this? I said, ask that person when he's blind and whether the counting finger this much distance, he can see his plate. He can see whether he's eating dokla or dosa or chutney or sambar. And he can go to toilet and manage. And I think it is a real blessing. And I that is why I look young because every patient, when they get from PL counting finger to close to face or one meter, two meter, six meter, sometimes six uh, also. This is again a... Welcome to the Paralichi Retina Cinema. So this is another uh, uh, advanced uh, diabetic vitreptin using a 3D digital microscope. And this I recently presented to the one of the another very famous Paralichi meeting in South America. Like we have whale vitrectomy where 100, only top 100 vitreptin surgeons in the world are invited by Dr. McAmer as a tradition. And this is a 3D surgery. And that's me with a 3D glass, my nurse, and there's a assistant, Dr. Sonam Varma, who's now in indoor. Well, now it's a cataract with the IOL done, and I'm now uh, doing surgery. This is another uh, patient. I'm doing a 25 gauge, and all through the 3D surgery. So the 
The main thing is you can see a very bad uh, traction rectal detachment, and I'm now doing a three-port uh, path plantar vitrectomy and uh, removing the anterior posterior traction, tangential traction, and uh, you can see this patient at least has undergone laser, but still the patient has developed fibroascular proliferation, and uh, I think that is what the diabetologist, endocrinologists, general practitioners have to understand. If you are able to detect diabetes early, that means if you are uh, detecting diabetes at the age of 30 to 35, and then uh, watch him every six months, and then uh, you can treat by doing fluorescent angiography, OCT, laser, intravitreal injection, you will not have this. At least 90% of the patient can be prevented. And you can see I'm now struggling to remove this fibroascular uh, proliferation. I'm showing the full video, but I'll probably uh, put it a little forward because it's, uh, it will take time. As you can see, I removed almost the entire fibrous tissue and I, I'm forwarding it and see cutting the most of the membranes are uh, removed. And uh, this sort of uh, advanced surgery, which I show uh, to the rest of the world, and I've done live surgery in South America many times where I don't understand the language, but I can talk to the machine and I can, whatever I demonstrate, the whole world sees and I complete the surgery without atrogenic retinal break or complication. And uh, that is because you know that uh, even though I'm not touching it with the hand, I can have the tactile sensation through the glove and through the instruments. And you can see the previous break is endothermized. And then uh, you can see the entire uh, retina settle, doing a laser around the multiple retinal breaks created. And then uh, it is a happen in spite of the meticulous thing, but it's in the peripheral part, but you have to identify treat every break and don't be like shy of uh, uh, showing this in the live surgery. And uh, I remember in uh, Mexico once in 2014, I was doing live surgery and they told me, you didn't get a break and you're lucky. I said, no, my foot, there is no luck in surgery. It is only, uh, as Vivekananda, some Vivekananda says, everything is in your hand. You create the complication, you treat it. But if you're aware of it, you will not create a complication. You will prevent the complication. Here, there are hydrogenic breaks because the addition was so severe and you can see entire, uh, all the panretinal photocoagulation and all the breaks are covered. And then a fluid uh, air exchange done and then air oil exchange done. Now you see the silicon oil is filling the eye and this patient is doing very well. Maybe you would keep the oil for some time instead of removing the oil in three months, maybe keep it for six months, one year. So you Silicon oil also prevents the anti the vascular endothelial growth factor from migrating from posterior segment to the this is the size guys uh, in the OT and uh, so the favorable preoperative prognostic factors for a vitrectomy for a traction lateral detachment is shorter duration of macular detachment limited extent of macular detachment the presence of preoperative panretinal photocoagulation helps uh, an absence of vitreous hemorrhage and the favorable Preoperative pro, uh, pro, uh, prognostic factor if the vision is uh, 660 or better, absence of rubiosis, absence of retinal attachment involving macula. But most of the Indian patients come with unfavorable factors like macular detachment, combined retinal attachment. So 3D retinal surgery is a revolutionary technology. The unfortunate is it's very expensive and uh, many uh, surgeons and patients cannot afford but it benefits the, both the surgeon and the patient. So this is no financial interest I have in this presentation, which is in a widely accepted platform and it's a future technology, but maybe it'll be useful for producing 3D technology and robotic surgery, which can replace the surgeon. And, but it looks like it cannot replace the surgery because you still need the, the both the eyes, both the ears, the brain, the hands, both hands, both legs for operating. So tra traditional we have surgery, the posture like this, you have to sit all the time and leads musculoskeletal pain using direct view of endoillumination and prolonged exposure of patient retina to microscope. And so this is the ingenuity, which is made by Alcon. Again, I don't have any financial interest. I use Zeiss. This is a 3D high definition camera mounted on the microscope. But when you put this, you don't have the optics. And here you see, this is the Alcon 3D vitreal surgery equipment. And the benefits is improved ergonomics you can sit like this and operate. Well, I never thought I can sit like this and operate. Now I have to sit like this because of the microscope because you would see like this. So the neck is the problem and the back is the problem. The only way I keep the neck and the back strong, one is doing exercise, go to gym and strong, make the protagonist and antagonist muscles strong. That means the back muscle 
and the abdominal muscle. I actually like make the abdominal muscle like a bowl. Apart from that, you should do hula hula dance or a regular dance so that your back is strong. And uh, it's not only ergonomics, but I think uh, you have to reduce the musculoskeletal fatigue. You sit like this, your neck and back will go. And 65% of uh, eye surgeons and uh, retinal surgeons in the world have got traction. They have made a, a what do you call neck uh, collar or have done MRI and has pain, taking tablet, they have taken bed rest, touch wood because of the exercise and blessings of the patient. And uh, I don't have that. Benefit with 3D ER surgery, it has a digitally enhanced visualization. Digit, uh, we can also use various uh, the digitally applied red filter and real-time responsiveness. Actually, there's a 28 second, microsecond uh, lag. That means you make a force up like this, slowly you'll see it. But I think you get used to it. And then it, uh, you have a good adaptability. Switching to digital 3D VR surgery can be a challenge for many. But for me, because I'm mentally trained, there's a thing called mirror neuron. That, what that uh, means means you keep seeing, observing, and that's what Leonardo da Vinci had as well as uh, Charles Darwin had. So if you read the book called uh, um, uh, Concise Mastery, where how the masters were there, like the Leonardo da Vinci, the, uh, the Mozart, who was a music person, and uh, Malcolm Gladwell has written, if you want to be like a Mozart for music, if you want to be like a Leonardo da Vinci, or Michelangelo, who created that uh, um, uh, the, the various sculptures, the David, and uh, which is there in Florence, you have to have that uh, and my mirror neuron, which you have to develop, seeing the surgeons developing that, and that book says beautifully. And I think uh, it's an advanced teaching tool. Whatever you are seeing, whatever I showed you, anybody in the operation theater can see. And maybe one day we'll be able to transmit 3D I don't know when. I'm learning from that uh, cyber, uh, uh, from the Orbis team. And this is what the OT setup looks. You can see the funder photograph. It's not a funder, you can see the funders. And this is how the 3D vitreous hammer, you can see the quality difference. This is a high definition uh, vitreous uh, record, uh, recording from the 3D directly. And you can see the vitreous hemorrhage with a long standing proximal detachment with a long standing proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And uh, you can see that uh, again, uh, you, you are clearing the vitreous hemorrhage. And as uh, you can see, the hazy media. And that's because of the, and now I'm using steroids to stain the uncut vitreous. And then you can see the uh, fibrous, uh, the uncut vitreous, which is attached, I'm clearing all around. And the uh, entire um, vitreous skirt is also being removed. And then uh, you can see fine vitreous, which is there, are removed. And then, so this is how the quality of surgery improves, and you do a and a, a very tight pan retinal photocoagulation. Sometimes I do 1,500 to uh, 2,000 burns on the table and then uh, do your fluid air exchange using the retinal brush and you can see the entire vitreous cavity is now uh, totally covered and you, in, do it with the air, fake eye, using the wide, wide angle observation, we don't touch the cornea. In the 80s, when I was operating in Dr. Badinath, I remember learning from Steve Charles that this is antivascular endothelial graft factor infection injection. And now I'm doing a, a no, no suture technique where the ports are removed and the eye is left like that. And this is how the vitreous surgery is uh, completed. And uh, so to remove diabetic blindness, I introduced this Jyot Se Jyot Jala program. Thanks to Dr. Subhuti Patnaik, Dr. Kim, Dr. Sheila John, Dr. Rajiv Raman and all the people. And I thank every ophthalmologist GP in the country as a president, I introduced this program. I'm glad everybody is picking up and specific is uh, it's like one candle lighting another candle. So one All India Ophthalmic Society told Dr. NSD Raju and Dr. Budi, Dr. Kuresh Muskati who did with IMA and now every state is doing and we want to continue. We request Dr. B. Kenak, President All India Ophthalmic Society to carry forward this and I'm happy to continue as chairman if they give me this. And this is uh, Dr. IMA and AOS, Dr. Babaraj Nindran, past president of All India, and Dr. NSD Raju coined it. Diabetes invariably affects both eyes. Test your eyes soon. And this is for the public. We should put a poster in every eye clinic and every diabetes clinic and every general practitioner's clinic. And thanks to my grandfather, who was a uh, Dr. S. Nataraja Pillai, who was practicing in the same government of Kalmyk Hospital, and my father, 
late Dr. N. S. Sundaram, who actually practiced, uh, who was uh, uh, like born in near Kanyakumari and practiced uh, in uh, Madras and retired as the director of the Government of Kalmik Hospital. And Dr. Nataraja Pillai worked in uh, uh, the Ganjam district where uh, Dr. Subudhi hails from in Orissa because he worked from Kanyakumari to Orissa because Madras presidency under the government of uh, uh, British government was uh, one uh, is in some state is a princely state and he was posted anywhere so he spoke uh, Oriya he spoke uh, 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 Telugu uh, Andhra uh, Telugu because uh, Andhra Orissa and uh, Tamil Nadu were in the uh, Madras presidency so we have done all together 150 years of service to notion nation I have done 31 years of Aditya Jyoti Hospital two years in Bombay Hospital then uh, five years in uh, Shankaranayaka and before that in government of Kalmik Hospital and that so I want to quote uh, Dr. Swami Vivekananda, my guru, they alone live who live for others, rest are equivalent to death. So if you're not serving others, you make money, no problem. But if you don't do service to others, I think uh, you're not worth living. And uh, this is the government of Kalmik Hospital, which is standing tall today, thanks to the IO Hospital, which was started in 1819 by the British, but my grandfather, my father, Dr. Venget Sami, the founder of Aravinda Hospital, Dr. G. N. Rao's father, uh, Dr. Rao, who also was a, a faculty in the same eye hospital, Dr. Badinda, and many others, including me, that are alumni of this. And we are proud that Elliott School of Ophthalmology is the oldest museum in the world. And I want uh, everybody to uh, uh, clap for this. The reason is you have to be proud as an Indian. We introduced uh, ophthalmic museum in the world and which is the largest museum and now the uh, American Academy of Ophthalmology has created a museum of ophthalmology in 2020. They opened in 2021. I'm in that uh, uh, museum committee of AAO where two ophthalmologists have given six million dollars as a donation. That means 12 million dollar museum that is. It's an out of the world museum like in Washington Museum. They have created in San Francisco. You should visit. I have not visited still. I'm going, hope to go in November because I'm part of the committee where they are really got brilliantly done. Uh, Six million is donated by Dr. Marmer, who was a retina surgeon, chairman emeritus of ophthalmology department of Stanford, the Bayer Institute, and Dr. Uh, uh, from Nebraska, the Trulson, Dr. Trulson, who's uh, donated Six million dollars and also donated another few million dollars to Nebraska. I wish one day I'll become rich and create something like that uh, in the in the future. And uh, thanks to Dr. Aishwari Ayer who made this presentation. I'm sure uh, she's in this uh, group. So I thank all of you for a uh, patient uh, listening. I know I don't know whether I've crossed the time. I lost time because I, I now see the time it is 7.50. So I crossed the time. But anyhow, no, no, need. Actually, no need to see the time. Yeah. It's a wonderful, wonderful experience and wonderful videos. I don't think this time is a bar. <laughs> Thank you. Clap, sir. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Kata. <laughs> yes, it was a really wonderful journey, you can say. Just like a cinema picture. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm actually watching uh, nowadays in the big 70 mm screen and operating. <laughs> uh, sir, sir, for yes. senior people, I want to ask two questions, very yes. unique questions, especially to Natarajan. I don't okay. ask, I don't ask these questions to others. Okay. okay. Number one, you said diabetic vitrectomy. You are tackling retina. Yes. When you say vitrectomy, why do you tackle retina? That, right. is, uh, that is number one question, especially to Natarajan, sir. Right. See, which is, now I'll answer the question, then you ask the second. See, which is when you are born, is attached like this. Yeah. So, to yeah. track the, we are actually doing a diabetic vitrectomy to yeah. remove the this, uh, separation. So, yeah. this can't be done without uh, touching the retina or uh, touching the vitreous. So it has to be a vitreoretinal retinal surgery. Yes. And that is why we are called as a vitreoretinal retinal surgeon. And yeah. as you rightly said, it yeah. is, everybody says, and yeah, I'm also writing, I think I should cite a vitreoretinal retinal surgery, diabetic yeah. vitreoretinal retinal surgery. Yeah, diabetic vitreoretinal retinal surgery or diabetic vitreoretinal retinal repair. Second, yeah, right. 
second question is uh, future of uh, uh, what is that uh, OCT intra operative OCT is under research. Uh, yes. I don't know. Let us. Will you please enlighten us? Yeah. See, OCT gives the layers of retina. So, uh, intraoperative OCT is actually available commercially. And there are some, uh, I think in India, Dr. Narayan Netralaya has it. My student, Dr. Supriya, is a consultant there. She was using it. Now, I think Dr. Chaitra is using it. And yeah. uh, uh, I'm not sure whether they have. I don't answer. I think all Indians should have. The problem of uh, intraoperative OCT right now is whatever we are seeing this traction, which I'm seeing through the 3D or microscope, that will tell you whether you are holding it. For example, you're holding it and it will show in the OCT whether it is doing it. But I think uh, the, in, even though there's an interface, I, I, I don't know, because it's like a great story for me because the, even this uh, 3D was 3.1 crore, the three, uh, this uh, RTO 850, which I'm using. With all the facility was 3.1 crore. If you added another set lamp, uh, uh, sorry, uh, intraoperative OCT, it was another uh, 60 or 80 lakhs, I think. So I thought for a surgeon who can manage it without intraoperative OCT, and I spoke to all the, uh, uh, the I, I spoke to all the uh, surgeons who are using intraoperative OCT, including the pioneer, Dr. Uh, uh, Sunil Srivastav who's an uh, Indian, but an uh, American uh, veterinary surgeon in uh, Cleveland Clinic. I, I think uh, uh, still there is a limitation. And I remember when I introduced wide angle observation system, it is like using the pan fundoscope. You should have heard of that Rodenstock lens mm -hmm. in the 70s, which was there with the bulky lens. And everybody said, Are, how can we use it? But people were using it. And then it came the Gonio lens and then the 3D, three mirror came. So the same thing they incorporated in biome, but nobody was uh, having the guts to use it because they said it's bulky and Michael Spitzner introduced in 87, even though he was a German, Germans didn't follow it. His own students didn't follow it. I, I don't know why I picked up in 90, I introduced, I went and taught all over the world, in, including US, Japan. And uh, mm -hmm. I remember going to even uh, Europe and teaching. Yeah, mm -hmm. only in 95, I became an expert. And uh, when 95, Dr. Jonovich, when he came, sorry, Dr. D. Uh, Juan, uh, who came to Mumbai, said, oh, this is not for uh, us, and I think it's not going to be in place. And Shankaranjali said they don't want to use it at all, for whatever reason. I mean, it is like a surgeon to surgeon. But in 96, live surgery was done by Dr. D. Juan in Johns Hospital Hospital, transmitted to Italy in Rome, and then he said, that uh, I learned from India and I'm doing this because I first thought we cannot use it and then he did it. Now, almost uh, all over the world, they are using the either the biome or another contact system, wide angle observation. The idea is, otherwise you'll see only optic this. Now we can see the entire uh, screen. That means right from optic nerve to the peripheral layer. So you know you are pulling something, what happens in the periphery, you'll know. So coming back to that, OCT is in the infancy, not in research. It is available practically for using, but we are, we are not at least uh, we are not able to get the use of uh, uh, intraoperative OCT like me at least. But uh, surgeons like uh, Peter Stremen in uh, Belgium is using it regularly. And the only thing is you can see the uh, whatever you are pulling on the macula or a tear happening, everything or even ILM peeling, you can see that. But for me, I can see the membrane directly. So I was wondering uh, from my side, uh, still it is not uh, required in my hands. Very excellent information, sir. Uh, when yes. you when you apply laser, uh, actually sub-minimal inflammation is there. Uh, yes. Intravitreal intra triamcinolone uh, reduces that sort of uh, inflammation and uh, you, you are washing it off also. Uh, some people say, as you said, you know, fungus, like the, in general, why do you say? In general, we can use intraoperative transylone and wash also. What yes. is your no. opinion, sir? That, that is the, the reason is they use the same while and use it in the same day OT. That produces the problem. So while operating, we yeah. open one part and throw it off. So we usually once. And then second is it's the operation theater. 
not in the outpatient or in a side ot so that is why during surgery everything is under sterile precaution and there is no preservative so uh, it is safe but earlier people were injecting canacord uh, canalog uh, whatever comes in the commercial which is for a uh, uh, intravenous and they converted in diluted and injected it any other questions from any other participants no yeah, participants one, one of the participants yeah, asked yeah. Uh, what is fluid gas exchange c3f8 or silicon oil basically they mm. want to know what vitreous substitutes you will use in the various cases the yeah. choice so one in a, if you read the history one graphe attempted uh, to touch the vitreous but he couldn't succeed he was a cataract surgeon and he introduced the one graphe as knife but later Dr. Macamer did the first. Uh, before that, Robert Kastner did the uh, open sky vitrectomy, and then Dr. Macamer did the uh, uh, closed vitrectomy, three port vitrectomy. So when you remove the vitreous, for a long time in the history, they thought removing vitreous will remove the uh, support of the eye. They thought the eye will collapse. I, I was surprised with a question from a patient's daughter two days back, whom I did vitrectomy today. She asked me the same question. Doctor, if you remove the vitreous, I will collapse. So I said, "How do you know?" No, no, I read somewhere. I said, "All right, send me the question." She sent me, and I told her, "We are doing millions of eyes have undergone vitrectomy, and eyes are safe." And uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, so one of the question came as whether vitreous is a vestigial organ. No, because vitreous, as the doctor uh, Kata was asking, I explained, vitreous is attached to the retina when you are born, and then the separation takes place. The vitreoretinal skill, surgeon skill is. Separating and inducing posterior vitreous separation, which is a problem. And when posterior vitreous detachment happens in the myopic or a post cataract, they only pull and produce the, the retinal detachment. So uh, when you remove a vitreous, they, we need uh, uh, something to fill. So during the surgery, either we fill the eye with the BSS, or we fill the eye with the uh, fluid air, or we fill the eye with gas or oil. So there is an indication for all. So uh, the idea of using the air is to uh, fill the vitreous cavity with something so that the bleeding doesn't <laughs> happen. And the gas also non-expansion so that the uh, fine bleedings don't happen. That is why nowadays we're using anti-vascular endothelial growth factor one day before, and then if they have done laser before, then do pan-retinal, and as uh, Dr. Kata said, steroid, and then you also do the Fluid air exchange and use a non-expansional gas mixture, either SF6. SF6 is a short-acting gas. That means it will be there for a week. If you use air, it will go in 48 hours. That means what I meant is the vitreous cavity is like this. So if you use the gas, it should fill total fill. But if you use air, slowly the air will come become small. But if you use SF6, it will be there for two three days full, and slowly it will come back. C3F8, two three weeks it will take, then it will come to so slow. So that is why the mixture is important. And if you use the wrong mixture, you can have a, a intraocular pressure going up. And silicon oil is used as a tamponade when there's a traction detachment or a PVR repaired and only to use as a tamponade. But uh, if you read history again, Dr. John Scott, and before that, Paul Sibis used silicon oil in 1965, where they didn't do vitrectomy. They just injected oil into the vitreous cavity and then made a sclerotomy and drained the fluid, thinking it'll work. It didn't work. Silicon oil is not an instrument or a magic. Dr. Jovanovich was very clear. And I remember meeting Madame Bonnet in uh, uh, Lausanne, uh, what is that, Lyon in uh, France. And she was against silicon oil. She said, I do vitrectomy with 3D uh, mirror. Because uh, each one was a fanatic surgeon or a, uh, what do you call, uh, adamant surgeon. So, but adamant surgeons have done great for the patients. She was doing surgery with 3D, uh, sorry, uh, 3 mirror. And also seeing the post-op with 3 mirror. It's terrible. You put the lens in the post-operative patient, patient will cry, uh, patient will have pain. Here we do non-touch. We don't touch the eye at all with indirect. Biome, we don't touch the cornea. So cornea is clear, no need. And then we were using, uh, uh, putting ringer lactate uh, uh, continuously on the cornea and you make the corneal edema happen. And I remember once uh, the sister gave me uh, distilled water instead of uh, uh, ringer lactate in uh, Shankarnathalaya. And then I was putting Suddenly, the whole cornea became white. Dr. Vajana could not operate. I was assisting and the whole thing became white. And I, was, I got a scare. I don't know what happened. So he said, uh, uh, luckily he was in a good mood. He said, uh, instead of uh, 
ringer lactate you given me uh, saline it told me it said distilled water it said i asked the sister what happened that is why we, it is important to announce that i am giving gentamicin i am giving this dose and i am giving steroid steroid and no needles have to be kind of, so i think the vitreal surgery it has to be meticulous not only the surgeon the entire uh, team so to answer the what is the uh, silicon oil so silicon oil should not be used just like that uh, if the retina is not settling people are using oil and if there is a inferior fluid they are using oil no you have to do vitreal retinal surgery to make sure no traction is there on the retina then you use multiple retinal break happen in the last case which i showed then i do laser there is no traction and then you use oil and later that's why we can remove the oil 3 months 6 months later so that when you remove the oil we don't have redetachment so if you are not a retina surgeon uh, please don't advise the patient uh, they use gas use oil sometimes patient come and ask me sir will use gas or oil i tell them are you making me a mechanic as a your yeah, petrol shop you are asking me whether i have to use a gas or oil i think it's not a shop i am a surgeon so leave that choice to me and that is not my choice depending on the eye the I, i will inject gas i will change i have taken a concern that during the surgery i will change the procedure and that's why the surgical self education is like playing soccer football the opponent <laughs> team you know what they are going to do and that is why we have taken 41 years uh, for hockey to get a medal again in olympic so thanks to indian both men and women actually there is a lot of research going on on vitreous substitutes in america yeah. number number 1 is a transparency number 2 is compatibility number 3 is a duration for which it stands so correct till there is a lot to replace vitreous we hope correct. many many substitutes do come in future no the use of myself and dr badnath started research if dr shila john goes back to the history in shankranetralaya we have presented in the ethical committee and we did a research with dr mani who is a great nephrologist of india is a in the ethical committee of the shankranetralaya uh, research board and we did uh, I, i took it up as a vitreous substitute but it didn't work and now dr gopal is uh, it's not only america sir our own indian dr l gopal we, we both were trained together he is now come out with the vitreous substitute even yeah. though he is indian but working in singapore along with carolyn chi in singapore yeah. he is working on a he is already published in the initial paper and i think uh, i hope it will come because we need a transparent and an inert subject substance and i remember one dr chalam again from andhra pradesh who settled in florida told me he has got a substance which we will inject and it will be fluid and when you come out by the time it touches the body temperature in the retina it will become a solidified like a gel but uh, we could not it is not succeeding so one is it has to uh, stand the test of time so dr nakpal also was doing something and i am still struggling and uh, i think one day we'll get what about the dyes sir <laughs> intravitreal dyes used in vitreous retina surgery yeah. So that is why it is called a chromo vitrectomy that means colorful vitrectomy there are uh, thousand uh, uh, dyes which are uh, good in using the eye so i have another friend professor peter crawl who also retired about 10 years back or 20 years back i think so he was a professor in marburg uh, which is in the philips university he was a, another pioneer in chromo vitrectomy and his fellows uh, have taught me and then they were trying so many dyes the idea is indocyanin green was introduced by dr paul tornambe and he called the uh, emerald uh, city that means you put the that was a beautiful stain but unfortunately icg produces uh, uh, the, the, when you use the endo eliminator <coughs> toxicity that is why we are instead of photodynamic therapy with vetroporfin we have used uh, uh, the myself and dr nazim hussain who is a consultant now in uh, sharja uh, dubai Uh, icg guided uh, photodynamic therapy and we have publi- published in i think igo i think 20 years uh, not 20 yeah uh, almost 20 years back so i think uh, the dyes have a role we have now brilliant brew and uh, even steroids have been used as a dye so that means color color you can use blue green white and maybe and now with the same color using the filters in the 3d 
you can modify yourself and see the screen and then operate so that you don't have to stay in for longer because every day it has to be biocompatible by the retina and also i worked on a substance to dissolve the vitreo retinal interface or a connection and i tried working with japan but the problem is whatever you use to dissolve it either dissolves the retina or produces a, a damage to the optic nerve and that means you have to do erg vp in the animal and now there is a group called uh, i am now working with a national biotechnology unit uh, in kalsa college which is in the science and arts college where they are have a society for doing clinical research without animal uh, research which is amazing i i didn't know so i am now trying to do ophthalmic research with them without animal uh, research i hope uh, we just uh, i'm making the mou so i am actually registered for a phd on diabetic retinopathy uh, with the maastricht university idea is not for one more degree the idea is i want to attract uh, whoever postgraduates are here or whoever uh, uh, professors are here like me who can register professor rajvinder kaur is here and uh, she just saw, i saw uh, she written wonderful inspiring lecture thank you the idea is to inspire everybody what swami vivekananda did in 1898 i want to do in 2021 to not only eye doctors i have a fan club with a 10 year old and 12 year old who has been operated by me there is one case to be presented by dr aditi parasar i think may i request dr aditi to uh, present the case dr sila so yeah, she has to present the case yeah yeah i'll just uh, do the share screen introduce yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh. Now I'm introducing Dr. Aditi, who is going to present the case. She is from Eastern Eye Hospital, Kangra, which is a consultant there. She has finished her MS Ophthalmology and a fellowship in medical retina, and she has several publications. Now I invite her to do the. Uh, Dr. Aditi, my daughter's name is Aditi, and uh, where is uh, my? Sorry for my ignorance. I forgot where is Kangra. Uh, so first of all, it was an excellent uh, video presentation. I am really thankful to you and or to the all team of Tosi who has you know given me the opportunity to come and at least share and learn whatever little I know. So this is a place uh, Kangra. It is in Himachal Pradesh, sir. I know I have been there, but I forgot where in where is it in Himachal Pradesh? Uh, sir, district Kangra. It's in proper Kangra. No, no, no. I know where is it. How how do you reach uh, Kangra? Sir, you, you can you you can take a direct flight from uh, Delhi and reach to Kangra Airport. Oh, I didn't know there is airport. Okay, but I remember coming from Chandigarh. Uh, yes, sir. There is a flight from Chandigarh. No, no. How far Chandigarh, from Chandigarh, Chandigarh. to Kangra? Chandigarh to Kangra uh, by uh, by air. So you are asking just thirty minutes. By road, by road. By road six sir. I know. I remember coming. I don't know uh, what for. I came. That's why. So I got confused between. Sir, uh, North, sir, North, North Zone of Thermological Society Conference in Tanda. Ah, right. Okay. Yes. You, you had come I, in Tanda, sir. Tanda. Right. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Correct. Thanks for reminding. <laughs> I have been to Dharmashala. I have been to uh, what is the other place uh, in Himachal Pradesh? Many places. I went to. I mean, I love to go to India everywhere. Only thing is, Corona is tying me down. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah, good. End of the year, you can go. Very pleased to interact. Always welcome. <laughs> okay, Dr. Aditi, please present your case. Yes, sir. A very good evening to all of you. I am Dr. Aditi Parashar. I want to thank the entire team of TOSI for giving me the opportunity to learn from the Star Wars, and I also want to thank my director, Dr. Sandeep Mahajan. My case for today is a 68-year-old gentleman who came to us with the chief complaints of diminution of vision in both eyes in the last two months. There was a history of uncontrolled diabetes. since 15 years and there were no other systemic comorbidities no any history of cardiac illness the visual acuity on examination in the right eye 
the best corrected visual acuity was 2 by 60, and in the left eye, it was 6 by 60. The intraocular pressures were 16 and 70. The rest of the oc ocular edin XA and extraocular movements were within normal limits. And in the anterior segment, the patient had a nucleus sclerosis grade one cataract. Rest of the findings were unremarkable. Please excuse me that I don't have the fundus photograph since it is an old patient of mine. But this is the fundus photo. Uh, th this is the OCT which is showing. Uh, can you please move the slide, uh, Shweta ma'am? Shweta ma'am? Now, this is the OCT picture which is showing uh, that the patient had a PDR with CSME in both the eyes. Please shift the next slide, ma'am. As you can see, the patient had a center involving macular edema with more of a skytic kind of edema in both the eyes and with an SFD in the left eye with few HRF spots. In view of the above findings, I decided to give intravitreal antivirtive in the patient and I injected bevacizumab in both the eyes at an interval of one week, thrice at a gap of one month. And I also added on PRP3 sittings in both the eyes. And side by side, I ordered a complete investigation of complete blood count peripheral blood smear, lipid profile, LFT, RFT, 24 hours urine routine, microalbumin. They all came out to be deranged. And in view of the deranged systemic profile, the patient was put on dialysis. Initially, he was put on dialysis twice, and then it was made thrice a week. Ma'am, please shift the slide. The next one. And this is how his OCT picture looked like three after three months of treatment. You can see there was a significant reduction in macular edema in both the eyes. However, in the left eye, there was a persistent SFD. And hence, I decided to add focal laser in the right eye. And in the left eye, I decided to add ranicizumab. This time, I shifted from Evastin to ranicizumab, and I gave it at an interval of one month in, in the left eye. And finally, on when the pair, after receiving uh, five antivirgins in the left eye and three antivirgins in the right eye, there was an improvement in the visual acuity. And for the first time, the foveal contour also started to maintain. As you can see from the picture from 23rd of August. Ma'am, please shift the slide. Ma'am, the next one. Yeah. As you can see, there was significant improvement uh, in, in the patient's macular edema from 23rd August to 28th January. And for the first time, even the visual acuity improved. The best corrected visual acuity in the right eye was 6 by 9. Ma'am, please, next. However, in the left eye, there was a reduction in macular edema, though, but there was this persistent extra foveal edema in the left eye. Ma'am, please, next. And hence, I decided to add focal laser in both the eyes. And after that, the patient was kept on a regular follow-up. But the good thing was that at this point of time, the patient had achieved a good glycemic control. His urea creaths had come to normal. And even the anemia which the patient was suffering from was under control. Ma'am, the next slide. And the uh, uh, patient continued to maintain a good visual acuity of 6 by 9 in both the eyes. As you can see from the OCT pictures, there was a, a reduction in the macular edema as, uh, as well as in the extra edema. Ma'am, the next one. So this is the final uh, visit that I've added uh, that was on as on 27th of January 2021. There was almost, there was complete reduction in macular edema. The foveal contour was well maintained in both the eyes and the patient was maintaining a good visual acuity of best corrected six by nine in both the eyes. Ma'am, the next one. So just to, uh, ma'am, the next one. So just to summarize it all, even if our patients enter up into nef nephropathy, we should, a, a proper counseling of the patients is must. Definitely nephropathy leads to worsening of retinopathy, but if we control the nephropathy, there can be a reversal of retinopathy as well, as that happened in our, in our patient. So uh, I think we need to keep our nephrologist uh, uh, um, consultants in the loop so that uh, they should guide the patient that, okay, uh, you should maintain a, a regular visit with your ophthalmologist because many a times what happens is that patient loses hope since he has entered into nephropathy. So he is reluctant to come for a checkup. And many a times uh, I have seen many patients of mine also whom I had advised laser and injection, but the patient didn't turn up. And by the time the patient came back to me, he had a non-salvageable vision. But however, the if a good systemic control is maintained, the patient comes for regular visits and we are inter intervening right on time, we can definitely give patients good vision. Eventually, I think patients pays in the end. Thank you so much for your patient, patient listening. Now I would request the expert panels to please uh, give their suggestions on the following. Sir, what is the preferred antivegif in nephropathy patients? 
Answer, should nephrology clearance be sought in all patients who receive antivegic? And when exactly should focal laser be added? And what are the follow-up guidelines for such patients who continue to maintain a good visual activity? Thank you so much to all of you for your patient listening. Yes. 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 You're, you're muted. You're muted. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so you can start that up, Subhuti. Yeah, yeah. So the four questions she has asked is a really good presentation. So four questions are asked. Yeah. So what? Uh, can you repeat the first question, Dr. Aditi? What is the preferred endovegetal in, in nephropathy patients? Yes. So what is your opinion, Dr. Natarajan? So is there any contraindication for any, any specific... Uh, so I think uh, from, my, from my side, generally I prefer uh, like uh, ILEA because if the patient can afford. Otherwise, any of the anti measures there is no uh, specific for nephropathy. But only thing yeah. is, uh, any patient with nephropathy, I always take uh, not with nephropathy. I think for any anti measure, I have a practice which a lot of doctors are. <coughs> but uh, sometimes I have seen in India. Medical cases happen because they say when the diabetes is not under control, when the uh, uh, nephropathy, why did you give? And if, if it enters a medical legal problem, then it's a headache. I remember my own patient, uh, no, sorry, a patient, <coughs> his father he brought, and uh, somehow I was I never used, uh, what is that, uh, Bevacizumab. And uh, uh, then the patient didn't want to pay for that time uh, the Novartis uh, 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 anti -vager. And then uh, he went to uh, my own student, who's a consultant now. And uh, so I happened, took the anti of uh, in the morning. And in the afternoon, got a heart attack. And I had to be ad admitted and undergone a stent. And you know, he was trying to fight with me also by saying, <laughs> Can you give me an anti So because we got a clearance, and I think everything was all right, and we have already given, and every informed consent of any anti gives all the details. And that anti vegf injection does not have any systemic uh, yeah. uh, role except the anti vegf effect. We can, they also showed injecting in one eye can also reduce the rubiosis or something in the other eye. There has been report. Mm -hmm. So, anti vegf is within the circulation, can affect, definitely affect. And that is why they are talking about uh, IHD and uh, stroke uh, following Bivazid uh, map. And even though when the what is that? Pegaptinib sodium, the macrogen was there, they were talking, and the, um, Pfizer was talking about uh, But the problem was, if the efficacy was not as good as the Bevacizumab. So, the question here is, it happens. So, I think in India, it's better to have a nephrologist <coughs> clearance. Because our own nephrologist, according to me, fluorescent angiography has no problem. But the nephrologist says, no, no, it goes through kidney, you don't do it. So, I said, all right, no, I'll not do it. Now, luckily, we have OCT angio. But what mm. I'm saying is the water soluble dye and it does not get accumulated. And even in a dialysis patient, <laughs> they don't want to. Do. And post uh, uh, renal uh, transplantation also, they don't want to do because they, everybody wants to safeguard their skin, particularly when the patients are asking too many questions. So, medical legally, and I think if it's my father, I will ask for a nephropathy uh, clearance, nephrologist clearance, and then do it. <coughs> and most of the uh, patients come with uh, uh, the uh, macula involved. So, unfortunately, there's no role of uh, focal laser. Unless there are focal leaks, which you can give, reduce the swelling, and then uh, still it is there, you away away from the fovea, and it is <coughs> you can do a focal laser. And the guideline is uh, every macular edema patient, uh, uh, whether they have nephropathy or not, I think every month, uh, unfortunately, they don't like to come. And that is where... Uh, in the US, when it is regimentary, people were objecting and they were telling it's wasting uh, a patient's time, but it's not. And I think you have to make a system where I actually suggest now every month they have a checkup, try to make a preoperative antibiotic drops and prepare the patient for a clearance. So, for example, you come one month later, check the OCT with the patient need injection, uh, uh, let the patient pay and do the injection same time in the OT. I don't do it. So, monthly follow up is uh, important for a uh, follow up. And the problem is, uh, 
once the man there is no maxillary edema you can increase it to once in 3 months if it is normal make it once in 6 months then if everything is normal once a year and uh, still right eye left eye they have to do the am scan though the maxillary edema cannot be picked up but at least they will know one closing one eye what happened to the other eye thank you sir hello yes hello, sir, sir? Sir, yes, sir. On, on the contrary, research is going on. A uh, basic pathology in diabetes, even in nephrology, after seeing ophthalmology, usage of anti-VEGF. Why can't we use for kidney also? Basic pathology going. What happens in eye? <laughs> the same thing is happening in kidney. So after seeing yeah. ophthalmologists, why should we not? Is there another research going on? In a retinal, I mean a renal specialist also. This is yes. always going on. Diabetes, you know, diabetes is a, a systemic problem. Yeah. It's a micro angiopathy, and you also have a macro. But micro angiopathy is only affecting the blood vessels of the blood. the brain the eyes the uh, heart, heart and kidney heart kidney and the feet also neuropathy so yeah. it's a micro angiopathy and i think that is why uh, recently dr rajiv raman did a major program on angiogenesis so i think uh, the principle is same as you right and even that is why it happens in the uh, uh, even for gynecology so the angiogenesis is the same for uh, anywhere in the body Okay. And only thing is the diabetic retinopathy, the micro blood vessel change. What happens in the retina can affect the macula that produces uh, the uh, vision problem. But in the micro angiopathy in the kidney, unless it affects the uh, GFR, the glomerular filtration rate, or the kidney function, it doesn't damage much. Yeah. And even the brain, lot of a uh, normal uh, even uh, aging changes can happen uh, because of the blood circulation and even to the heart. But still, they survive, yeah. and then uh, a stroke may not happen, heart attack may not happen. That's why you do walking. That is why uh, every diabetic, from the day it diagnosed, you should make sure the blood circulates from the uh, head to the feet, and that's why you have to mobile. You have to be mobile. No sedentary work. Diet control. That is why I'm saying 30 to 35. You diagnose a diabetic. Teach him what is diabetic nephropathy, what is uh, cardiac problem, so that you no know, even before the renal people are doing research. why can't the public eat the properly why can't they eat uh, no rice no wheat and go to millets little millets quinoa like that mm. and be a healthy diet which was there 50 years back in andhra pradesh and tamil nadu yeah. like horse gram fox stay little millet so all that i think they we can do so that diabetes will not happen and more vegetables clean green leafy colorful vegetables which has and the oxidizing diet exercise uh, can increase the, and those sort of no need to go to any doctor sir. thank you sir so it's like apple keeps it away <laughs> i i think uh, we can make sure that they eat well so diabetes no need for medicine also the problem is that they all come late in india nobody check sugar every year it means you have to do fasting sugar pp sugar and hb1 ac once a year after the age of 30 35 because father mother grandfather grandmother somebody will have diabetes so why not the grandson do it at the age of 30 they don't want to do anything over yes. doctors are looting by asking for blood uh, test yes that that very wrong word looting looting is a very wrong word they utter uh, i am telling this because our <laughs> family here all doctors i think yeah. we have to condemn them so i keep condemning them in the opd i keep telling them hey we ask and then you say <laughs> doctor Khan has told that doctor and labs have got nexus. Exactly, that's. Uh, and sir, the uh, problem is doctors are doing no. Not Shweta, all. can you stop the sharing? Miss Shweta, can you stop sharing? Any other any any other person? Stop the screen. Any question or comment? Sir, I want a, a little update from Natarajan sir. Update mm -hmm. in the pharmacotherapy. while cutting difficulty in erms at past collagen coagulators were being used any intro operative coagulators to uh, pacify the erm to facilitate the cutting of erms no erm doesn't have any vascular part erm is no vascularity zolia no, yeah. but 
fibroscular proliferation in diabetes can have vascular part. But again, coagulation, if it coagulates the normal blood vessel, you have a problem. Yeah. So that is why we are using diathermy and we are using anti vegf uh, in a micro dose so that uh, only the new blood vessel is affecting. That is why in photodynamic therapy in ARMD, we are straining the, uh, the, uh, the lip lipid uh, lipophilic drug, vetroporphin, with a new blood vessel, and we ablate only that using well, a cold laser. Well, Thank you. So I think uh, it's the time to close up now. So yes. thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Sila, your yes. comments. <laughs> Excellent lecture and a very good presentation. I think we also had a very good uh, discussion also on the various aspects of vitreous surgery. And uh, thanks, sir. We have gained a lot of insights into vitreous surgery. Thank you very much. Uh, basically, we are all, most of us are uh, cataract surgeons. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But the so take home message you. should be the take home message should be we should prevent people from going to that stage. Yeah. Correct. Correct. See, so that is what I thought. Like I remember Peter Hamilton to, in 1988 when I met him in Bombay in the Jaslok Hospital in the, uh, the CME. He told me I'll put all vitreoretinal surgeons out of job by doing laser. <laughs> it's not going to happen. The reason yeah. is the patients are 77 million. We are only 23,000 ophthalmologists. Uh, physician maybe in lakhs, but uh, every patient is not going to the physician. Mm -hmm. We have all sorts of uh, medicine, uh, homeopathy, Ayurvedic, and all that. In spite of that, some people claim, uh, uh, Baba Ramdev claims you can do anything with yoga and do it. People don't know. And he says you don't even need a glasses. And Dr. Katra need not wear glasses also. Swararag. <laughs> Swararag. <laughs> Swararag. <laughs> We have a Tirkural which says, Epurul Apurul Mepurul That means whatever you learn from any learned person, whether yeah. it is Dr. Bhajanat for me or uh, Swamiji or Swami Vivekananda, he says, analyze, check, yeah. cross check, recheck, counter check. That's what Dr. Bhajanat said. Even if I teach you, he says, check yourself. Don't question the teacher yeah. because the teacher is authority. In the subject, but you find out from yourself whether that uh, knowledge is right. So in India, nothing, any advertisement they see and uh, the, anything they do. And uh, that's why I love superstar Rajini Gandhi. He doesn't advertise, he says, I don't want my fans to take Coke. Coke was ready to give money for advertising. So that way, I think whatever you recommend, I think it should be something which is uh, I, I, what I'm saying is you, you have to be really uh, for it. So I think. Uh, here, I recommend that uh, every Indian, the all doctors should tell them to eat well. That means eat green leafy. I tell every day, eating good food, healthy food is the most difficult job because none of us are used to that. So better to use a good uh, uh, vegetable, uh, good uh, colorful uh, fruits, than uh, use, uh, what do you call, uh, no rice, no wheat. But we are all used to that telling it's staple diet. Yeah, yeah, we can And we all eat that. I'm not against I also love rice. Or eat in quantity, yeah, yeah. no. You won't eat like this. If you go to Kashmir, they eat like a mountain. And even in South, in Tamil Nadu. Yeah, and exactly. <laughs> we can't survive without rice. Yeah. No, that is what they have made themselves. But now, because of the rice, they are dying, they don't know. See, the 77 million, million are in among us. And even in our All India, every time they are creating a, a rice is doing a program where Anybody can get checked, and every time Lalit Verma gives the report that uh, still there are a lot of people having uh, blinding diabetic retinopathy in one eye of ophthalmologist and our AOS member. I mean, we have to educate every day, and that's why I made a public interest movie which came in the TV. But it's again, mem public memory is short. I think we have to keep on reminding them. Uh, every state elect uh, doctor should go to the state uh, health minister and impress him. Hey, prevent diabetes, you will prevent it will be a great economic boon for India because yes. if the diabetic person lives longer, works well, has good vision, no kidney problem. Imagine no, no need for dialysis, no need for laser, no need for vitrectomy. And only that 10% who are genetically prone will have. That is because whatever you do, they will have a problem. But rest of that 90% uh, uh, of the people who are having diabetic retinopathy, which is 25% of the diabetic population, not all. 
all will not get retinopathy out of 100 only 25 diabetics will get and out of 25 two or three get vision threatening so the two or three if you detect that means about 1 million people or one uh, yeah 1 million people of, uh, who needs treatment even 23000 is a less number but uh, all of us can be busy treating them so, and uh, government hospitals are there for free treatment municipal hospitals are there then uh, we have private hospitals and ngos all can be tackled so people who have money should definitely pay the doctor people who don't have money go to the government hospital take it free they are all well equipped in yeah. bombay jj hospital sayan the nair hospital they are all well equipped and uh, they have most advanced i'm glad when i came nobody was having but now every i'm glad i have impressed every hod and they bought it yes not generally advanced advanced technology available almost to many of the medical colleges so yes yes, yes. yeah so first of all you should uh, create awareness uh, awareness is the i mean correct. weapon correct yeah yes so we can, we think we should stop here now today for today's yes. session yes. Ms. Shweta, yes. I think you should stop here now. You yes, can sir. stop. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Extended 15 minutes. No, no problem. problem, sir. No problem. It was a great session. <laughs> okay. It was a learning Thank session you. for all of us. Yes, sir. It was listening to a person like Dr. Natraj and Riyadh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sir. Yeah. Just like bo- just like movie. Attending a movie today. We yeah, attended the movie. <laughs> it's a wonderful yeah. session. Hi. Meet good, sir. Hi, information. Hi, information. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. I hope you like everybody. Yeah, Aishwarya, I told her every day I don't want the same presentation and I want something new. And <laughs> yes. she made it. Yeah, curious to talk. <laughs> Not <Natarajan>. much. <laughs> Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you very much.